Okay, so um, I've introduced myself once already, but um, what I wanted to do as well at the very start of this is introduce the project, which um, is where Martin's talk sits under. So um, we're working with lots of different partners, including the Environment Agency, ourselves, Grandma Keys, who I work for, um, and on the project Rediscovering the River Colm. Um, later on, I'll mention how you can get involved if you're interested in getting involved with all sorts of aspects of the project. Um, but I'll, I'll leave that until the very end so that I don't take up too much. Um, first of all, um, in terms of the project itself, if you're not aware of the project, it's a 10 year project by Watford Borough Council. And the main aims are really to kind of bring the river to the heart of Watford, where it once was um, 100, 200 years ago. So um, it's a over the first three years of the project, the aims are to kind of restore and protect um, as much as possible. So restore the river to what it once was, uh, protect habitats that are worth protecting. Um, and this is for the whole green corridor of Watford. So for the Colne from, um, if you know the inner part of Watford from Bushy Mill Lane um, in Meriden, all the way down to um, Lairidge Lands, just past Vicarage Road in the south um, on the Ebury Way. And there's various elements of the project that we're focusing on as a, as a charity with partners as well. And that's uh, in river works, so river improvements, which will take place in the next couple of years, uh, landscape and access works. And that is all sorts of stuff from artwork through to um, notice boards and information boards, environmental engagement, and also environmental monitoring, which is where my my job role comes in. So I'm um, in charge of environmental monitoring from Grand Marquis, and I'm working with various partners, some of which who are on this call, um, such as the Colm Valley Fisheries Consultative and Community Connections uh, CIC, uh, to try and create a citizen science project for the river. I've mentioned briefly about um, the location of, of the River Colm project that we're working on. Uh, this is from uh, Bushmill Lane, uh, Nutsford Playing Fields, all the way down to, to Lerridge Land in the south. So uh, quite a large area. It's about 2.2 kilometres of river. And um, if any of you guys obviously know Watford well, you might have a relationship with one of these parks or you might be uh, keen to get involved in one of these parks. We'd love to hear from you. I've mentioned this already a little bit, so I'm not going to go into too much more detail, but um, in part of this project and what we're trying to do with webinars such as this is where we're aiming to reach about 12,000 residents and local people, businesses, etc. with with the project. And that might be just purely with from an engagement point of view, people, people, making people aware of the river, making people aware of the data and, and stuff like what Martin's going to talk about, about fish populations around the coal and in the river as a whole. But it's also about kind of getting involved with protecting the river as well. So we're after volunteers to come and help us, uh, whether that's one day a year, whether that's every month, whether that's more than that, um, on huge amount of different projects that we're we're trying to get up and, and running um but we're just trying to make the river also a better place to uh, live and work by um at the moment there are lots of issues with the river Colne, some of which martin might touch upon some of which you guys know already uh, pollution um issues with plastic pollution as well and really uh, big things that we need to address over the course of the project um but just Regardless of all of that, um, what you guys are really here for is, is Martin's chat. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing my screen at this point. Um, I'll come back to this at the very end, but I'll hand over to Martin, who will be able to introduce himself uh, from the River Colm, from the uh, sorry, Environment Agency and, uh, and have a chat to you about uh, fish populations. Over to you, Martin. Cool. Thanks, Andrew. Bear with me just a moment. I'll just sort my... <clears throat> so my screens. Okay, hopefully you can see fish in the Watford Colne there. Um, okay, so um, yeah, Andrew's nodding. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so um, yeah, so I'm going to talk tonight um, a little bit about some of the species that we would expect to find in the Colne. 
um, some of the issues that they face um, and how we actually carry out the monitoring. Um, and then we'll look at a couple of the sites as well and go into a bit more detail and sort of show you the um, data that we get out and how we can kind of interpret that. Um, so my background, I've been with the agency for um, just a little over four years. Um, I started off as um, in, a mo in the monitoring team, so going around taking water samples, insect samples, that kind of thing. Um, and then I moved across to helping deliver the fish survey program um, and then went across to the fishery scene and, and I've been covering the column um, since sort of the end of last year. Um, so this is a con catchment. This is the area that I cover. Um, it's really diverse. Um, so if you sort of the north and the west, we've got our chalk streams, Ver, Gade, Bullbourne, Chess and Misbourne, and they all feed into the Colne. Um, and the Colne itself is predominantly chalk up until around sort of the Uxbridge area where it becomes more um, sort of clay dominated. Um, you know, there's a lot of interactions going on here. Obviously, we've got the GUC. Um, some big urban areas too, um, you know, a lot of development, a um, lot of uh, industry in the past. Um, and then as we come further south, we get to our distributary. So the Colnebrook, the Raysbury, Duke of Northumberland's Ash, um, yeah, it's an absolute maze once you get down there and then um, finally discharging into the Thames. Um, so yeah, like I say, really diverse and sort of the fish species that we find um, do reflect that. Okay, so some of the challenges, um, water quality being a big one, as, as Andrew alluded to, and as I'm sure as many of you know, um, in terms of how that affects fish, um, it can really limit growth and development of fish. Um, a lot of pollutants can disrupt um, the endocrine systems of fish, so their hormones, which obviously play a massive role in regulating growth and development. Um, so, you know, that can not only just affect um, you know, small fish, you know, eggs developing into fry and on from there, but also sort of the sexual maturation of fish. So can these fish actually spawn once they reach the age that they should be able to? Um, but it also indirectly affects them. So invertebrate communities and plant communities that the fish rely on are also affected by them. So um, yeah, quite far reaching consequences, but also it increases the likelihood of, um, more significant pollution events and fish kills which um you know obviously are undesirable but um some of these fish are quite slow growing and um, so it takes a long time for them to reach maturity and obviously if they get taken out of the population before that point um that's gonna reduce the sustainability of the population um fish passage so anything like weirs, sluices, culverts, all of these limit the available of hab the availability of habitat to fish and how much of that's successful. So, um, you know, a lot of weirs now, um, they they're sort of um, sort of artifacts from the past. Really, a lot of them were for um, you know navigation or agriculture industry. Um, you know where they needed a reliable source of water um but ultimately yeah the, these just limit the amount of habitat that is available to fish so um commonly we talk about spawning habitat you know can fish access the high quality spawning habitat that they need and we'll talk about that a bit more um but also you know throughout their life stages they need different habitats and if they can't access those that's gonna um, obviously affect the population and again how many fish reach maturity to reproduce. Um, so the, the river morphology, so that the sort of shape of the channel itself um, and whilst yeah we're talking about weirs and structures um, those basically have an impounding effect on the river so where the um, velocity of the water is slowed down that gives more time for sediments and um, silt that kind of thing to drop out onto the riverbed. Um, and that's yeah not desirable for many of the fish species that we would expect to find in the Colne. Um, <clears throat> naturally rivers should meander um, but over time um, I'm sure some of you will have seen maps of the Colne um, from many years ago and you know the rivers snaking all over the place so um, 
over over the years you know we straightened rivers that sort of picture on the bottom right that kind of hard engineering that we you know really try to shy away from these days you know whether it's for flood risk um again for irrigation drainage um you know these are all really quite bad for um the ecology of the river and naturally as rivers meander it's a constant process of essentially erosion and deposition so an area gets eroded it gets deeper and that material gets deposited somewhere else so it creates uh, variety in the river channel and dependent on the species and what stage of their life they're at you know they have different requirements so um a diverse river is a happy river really um yeah spawning habitat we kind of spoke about a little bit um quality of the spawning habitat is important so um i'm going to be talking a lot about gravel <laughs> um gravel is really important for a lot of these fish most of them spawn in gravel um but what's really important is the the space in between the gravel so there needs to be a good flow of water through there so that the eggs and the larvae are getting enough oxygen to develop um and invasive non-native species so um probably most well-known signal crayfish um you know burrowing to bank banks increase erosion um sediment into the river and it's increasing the turbidity of the river too um but they also eat fish eggs and um larvae so yeah a bit of a double whammy there um there's a few more I could talk about. That's probably the most relevant to the coln to the coln around Watford. But obviously, if you get further down the catchment, then you start encountering um, floating pennywort, which you know can just cover the river bank to bank, shades everything else out, has an impounding effect. So all those negative impacts that weirs can have, you know, that floating pennywort can um, have a similar impact. Um, but also, it's um, bad for flood risk too. Um, so obviously in an urban area, that's really not desirable. So why do we monitor fisheries? So ultimately, we've got a legal duty to do so. Um, so it's in the Environment Act, it's written that we've got a duty to maintain, improve and develop fisheries, which is essentially that's my job role, really. Um, but we need the evidence to do that. And that's what fish surveys give us. So, um, you know, when we're doing a fish survey, we can look at you know what habitat is there and is that going to give the habitat that the species we'd expect to be there need um so um yeah and you know and can it support the life stages that need to be supported um so in that same breath it lets us prioritize our resources you know if we survey a stretch of river and there's 12 different species um all different life stages really great abundance then obviously that's not going to be as much of a priority as us as um, another area um there's kind of three main um arms of the monitoring program so we've got our national fisheries monitoring program that's kind of a really long-term um set of surveys that we do annually and that was started in 2001 so some of these sites we've got so um data going back all the way to 2001 so that's really handy for um looking at long-term trends which really for fish surveys you need um and we'll get a bit more into why that's so important um but also it lets us meet our legal requirements so the water framework directive um this the score that um fish populations get directly into what classification a water body receives so it's really important in that um and where it sort of ties in with rediscovering the cone and with the project is it helps us to assess the success of projects for fish populations and really sort of quantify what impact the projects had so we'll be doing some surveys um in the next couple of months well next few months um to sort of give us our baseline and obviously we've got some of the long-term data that we can look back at too um but then going forwards we can do some surveys in the future and we can sort of see how um you know how hopefully the populations have improved or maybe if there's you know we need to do some tweaking to help certain life stages or certain species um so yeah that's that's sort of why we do it and the most important branches of the monitoring program so the sort of objectives and the outcomes that we want from our surveys we need to know what the current situation is so what species have we got what is their abundance like um and what life stages are they in 
because if you've got a broad range of life stages that shows that you've got a good diverse range of habitat versus if you are only finding you know large adult fish or juveniles and then that allows us to detect trends so whether that's in time so comparing past surveys or spatially so comparing it with local surveys um, and then from there we can try to figure out you know what's driven that change and what management can we do and what projects can we seek out to try and um, improve the situation if needed. So, so to talk a bit about the distribution of species and how that fits in with the coln. So um, you tend to, they often talk about zonation with river species and that all that really means is that you have different zones for different species. So, um, this line sort of going from the top left to the bottom right, that's the gradient of the river channel. And obviously, you know, higher up the catchments, it's steeper, so you get faster flow, um, higher oxygen, and quite often um, the temperature is colder and also more constant. And in a, sort of relating that to the cone, that would sort of be our chalk stream habitat. So, you know, places like the Chess, um, the Misborn, the Ver, you know, so, those kinds of places we tend to find trout, typically. Um, and then as you come down, <clears throat> you'll tend to find that um, obviously the gradient is decreased, so the flow is reduced somewhat. Um, temperature varies a bit more as you get more um, sort of urban runoff, that kind of thing. Um, but you'll also have an increase of organic load into the river, so how much organic matter is entering. And to break that matter down, bacteria uses up oxygen. So that causes the oxygen to decrease somewhat. So um, some species like trout that need a lot of oxygen may not be able to tolerate those lower levels, but there are species that can occupy that niche quite happily. Um, and then you'll also find in that sort of middle area, sort of looking at this sort of foothills, lowland um, sort of in between area, um, you'll still have clean gravel, so you tend to find more gravel spawning species. And then as you continue to go down, um, when you get into sort of lowland rivers, just pre-estuary, really, um, again, the, the flow is a lot slower. You'll have more sediment on the riverbed. So um, the, those species that their spawning strategy relies on gravel, um, that might not be successful here so then you tend to find species that are able to spawn onto plants instead and the oxygen is again lower here as there's more organic matter um, so again you'll only have species that can tolerate those kinds of conditions so the species that we have within the coln um, like I say you know working all the way up from the chalk streams down as quite a big variation in the habitats and that's why we've got such a varied fish population and um, like I sort of mentioned before that distribution is dependent on things like gradient um, the flow so how fast is the flow can that species tolerate that flow the temperature you know how tolerant are they of fluctuations the morphology how deep is it how wide is it um, the, the riverbed the substrate composition and then what food is available um, so I've written that river species can exhibit clear zonation, they can show them. The coln is a bit of a weird one and we'll find out why this isn't, you know, this, this, these aren't really hard and fast rules. So um, I've split the species up a little here, but as an overview, we've got about 23 species of fish that we would expect to find in the coln. The majority of them are cyprinids. So cyprinids, is, that's the largest family of fish, I think. Um, it's something like 2,200 species altogether, uh, maybe even more. Um, but basically how we classify cyprinid, it's um, got toothless jaws, um, pharyngeal teeth. So um, I've got pitched on those, but they're essentially crushing plates at the back of the throat. Um, and they've got soft fins with, um, you know, sort of soft rays. So when you look at a fin, it almost looks like veins and those are the rays. Um, and interestingly, Cyprinids don't have stomachs, quite a strange bit of physiology, but it's essentially an extended intestine, so a bit weird. Um, so yeah, we'll just work our way across these species. So this first group, um, a rheophilic species, so that is a Latin term, bit of a 
yeah, a bit of an ecologist term really, but that mean literally means resistant loving. So they like being in faster flows and their physiology sort of um, shows that they're adapted to live in those um, to live in those environments. Generally, you know, with those faster flows, you get higher oxygen levels. So they're again, uh, more suited to those kinds of environments. And where we've got those faster flows, that's when we've got those clean gravels and that's, yeah, predominantly their spawning substrate. And then we've got limnophilic fish. Um, again, bit of an ecologist's term, bit of Latin. Uh, so that translates to lake loving. So these are generally associated with the lakes and slower flowing water. Um, I'm, I've spotted a few names I know, and I know a lot of your anglers, and you're probably thinking, well, you can catch those in rivers too. And you're right, it's really not um, black and white at all. But typically, um, these fish are, can tolerate much lower oxygen levels and those and the fluctuations that associate with that and um they got much broader bodies but as a rule of thumb all of these what the main differentiation between them is that they spawn on um, macrophytes so on plants um roach is an exempt uh, exception so they can also spawn on gravels and that's partly why roach uh, have uh, proliferated so broadly and are such a successful species um, then we've also got a couple of others, so pike, a big predator, it's always important to have predators um, so that the population doesn't get too out of control. Um, trout, I mentioned a little bit earlier, so we tend to find them further up the catchment, but again that's not strictly true on the col. Eels, um, really fascinating um, species of fish and I will talk about them a bit more. Um, tend not to find too many around Watford yet and um, there are some interesting projects going on with Groundworks to um, put some fish parts, some well, eel passes specifically further down the catchment so around West Drayton, um, around Denham um, so hopefully we should see some more eels um, traveling up towards Watford um, and then slightly undignified a bit harsh but what when we're surveying when we're carrying out electrofishing what we call minor species um again these these are important to have in the river because they're you know part of the food chain a lot of these fish will consume these as part of their diet but when we're electrofishing it's very difficult to catch small fish as i'm sure you can imagine trying to net every stickle back out of a 100 meter plus stretch of river can be quite a challenge. So we tend to look at these just in relative abundance really. But again, it's very important to measure them. And specifically when we're looking at um, WFD and the classification on how well a river scores for fish, um, you know, a minor species is just as important as a wild trout. So um, yeah, they are still very important. Um, so a little bit of fish anatomy. So you can see the pharyngeal teeth I was referring to. So, you know, for crunch up mollusks or pellets or boilies, whatever the case may be. Um, but the main reason I wanted to show the anatomy is the lateral line. So um, the lateral line is essentially what the fish uses to sense movement. And what it is, is it's a line of its hair cells. Um, and when they sense movement, whether that's um, sort of positive movement i.e oh that my shoal mates next to me we need to stay close or a predator slashing that movement is transduced across into electrical impulse and then that causes excitatory synapses to fire and then the fish knows that there's movement there and it's essentially the um receptiveness of the lateral line is what we're exploiting when we're carrying out electrofishing um the electricity in the water causes those synapses to fire and that's what causes the movement towards us um but i'll get a bit more into um sort of the nitty-gritty of how um electrofishing really works shortly okay we'll look at some of the species that we expect expect to find on the column um so here we've got a barbel um this one was caught um near stockers nature reserve on the column uh 2015 i think this one was like i mean who wouldn't want to catch that it's an incredible fish really um you can just see from the shape that this fish you know bubble just love being in the flow it's almost like torpedo shape in the underslung mouth um 
juveniles and adults need really quite different habitats. So um, again, just trying to enforce how important it is to have connectivity on the river that fish can move between these areas throughout their life. You know, a juvenile would like um, little to no flow in the margins, um, sort of 10 centimeters deep and lots of sunlight. You compare that to an adult barbel, um, sure the anglers will know they they like tucking that they like deep areas with good flow but they like tucking themselves right into um where the cover is and it's amazing how many big barbel will actually um sort of shoal together in such a small space um so yeah so um juveniles they'll eat small invertebrates small insects even algae but then as they get bigger they'll start to eat larger insects, crustaceans, um, even small fish, um, very long lived species. They'll live to, you know, over 20 years. Um, a male will take around four years to reach sexual maturity, but a female um, five, maybe even up to eight years. So that's why it's really important to um, conserve fish over a longer term as it takes so long to reach maturity. Um, but even more so the fact that the larger the fish, the more eggs it can produce. So a barbel in sort of a female barbel in top condition can produce around 12,000 eggs per kilogram. So if you think, you know, a nine, 10 pound barbel, you're getting up around 50, 60,000 eggs. So, you know, quite drastic in amounts. And, you know, the more eggs you have going in, obviously they're food for everything in the river. So, you know, you really need to look after these big specimens and ensure that they can reach these bigger sizes. So barbels spawn around temperatures of 13 degrees. Um, I bring that up because you'll see all the different species have slightly different requirements in that sense. Um, but they've been documented to travel well over 20 kilometers in unrestricted systems. So that just shows, given the chance, they will travel long distances and they need to really to maximize um, their population. So yeah, again, just reinforcing how important it is to um, look at restoring connectivity. Okay, another very typical cone species, um, the chub. Um, so you can see the chub's got really big head and a massive mouth. So chub are notoriously greedy. Um, they'll eat just about anything. Um, but the bigger they get, the bigger they get, the more shy and wary they get. So once they get to a certain size, they can get very difficult to catch. Um, so compared to the barbel that spawns around 8, 13 degrees, chub actually spawn at 18 degrees, so much warmer. Um, and, you know, provided river conditions are good and the fish is in good condition, they can actually spawn multiple times throughout the season. Um, they produce even more eggs than barbel. So up to 30,000 eggs per kilo has been recorded, um, which is, yeah, just incredible amounts, really. And again, a very long lived fish. Um, they've been recorded up to around 22 years. Um, so yeah, really quite amazing that something can live in our rivers for that long. Um, talking about crayfish a bit before, um, there's a bit of evidence to suggest that essentially chub growth rates have increased a lot over the past couple of decades. And there's some evidence to suggest that this is actually driven by them consuming signal crayfish. Um, Obviously, there's that stage early on where the crayfish are doing a lot of damage, but once the chub reach, especially this size, yeah, they'll have no problem eating crayfish. Um, but yeah, one of my favorite fish. I love chub. And then we've got the dace, um, quite similar to the chub, um, but they're much smaller. And um, when we get new, new people starting with us, that's usually the one that we like to catch them out on. You see with the chub, hopefully you can see my mouse, but they've got, a, uh, sorry, with the dace, they've got a slightly underslung jaw and you can see the heads are much sort of finer shape um, than the chub. But the dead giveaway is the anal fin. So you can't see it too well on this one, but it's actually concave. So it curves in. When you compare that to the chub, you can really clearly see that's convex. So that's just kind of um, one way of telling the difference. Um, Dace like to spawn in much cooler water, um, around 10 degrees. Um, and it's really great when you see dace because they're an indicator of pretty good water quality. So if you've got a good population of dace, and that's a good sign that you've got good water. 
Okay, so that's kind of our predominantly river, our resistance loving fish. Um, and we come across to the roach. So like I said, roach really widespread, um, a pretty iconic fish really with the red fins and the red eye. Um, so like I said, they can inhabit so many different habitats. They can tolerate drastic changes in water quality. And with their spawning strategy of being able to spawn on eggs and gravel, um, yeah, massively successful. And they can also do it throughout a range of temperatures. So they've been recorded spawning in as low as eight degrees and even up to 14 degrees. So, um, yeah, amazing species, really. They can live pretty old, too, recorded up to 18 years, which is just mind blowing. Um, they don't get very big, um, you know very rarely get over four pounds or you know sort of 400 mils in length um and by the time a roach is yeah it's just incredible that they reach that point if you think you know a roach it it's everything in the river wants to eat it at some point in its life um so the, the fact that they get to that point is yeah really remarkable i'd, lo I'd love to catch a big roach one day then yeah another one of my favorites the perch so you can see again a broader body profile that we tend to associate with slower flowing water um again this was a, a colm perch um this was actually a repeat capture over many years actually um but you can see it's really well camouflaged so it's it well it, it doesn't start really start life off as a predator um it tends to eat small plank um algae small invertebrates but once it reaches a certain size then it will um turn its diet to predominantly fish um, but also crayfish um, and yeah they tend to lay their eggs on uh, weeds or tree roots um, sort of in long ribbons sometimes up to a meter in length and then I'll just touch on the eel too um, like I said really fascinating so this is the eel in its sort of adult form um, they'll live in our rivers lakes canals ditches anywhere they can get up into really and they can live quite a ripe age to over 25 years has been recorded um so they'll when they need to go return to sea um they'll begin to silver up um they'll undergo some other physiological changes that allow them to survive in salt water but their eyes will also get bigger um partly for you know to evade predators but also to feed when they're en route to their spawning areas so you can see this map so once they get down into the estuaries they travel all the way to the sargasso sea um, it's about a three thousand mile journey and um, so they've been recorded in the azores they've been caught randomly by trawlers in the middle of the atlantic and people went how am i catching a european eel and it took you know a lot of research until we managed to find out where these um where they're spawning um but then they yeah they'll spawn in the sargasso the eggs will drift along the gulf stream <clears throat> develop into larvae by the time they get to um our shores um and around europe they'll be what we call elvers kind of you know about the thickness of a pencil and then they'll migrate up our rivers into canals ditches lakes like i say anywhere they can get into um you know it, it makes it so hard to conserve them they are on the red list they are very endangered um but because so much and the, some of the critical life stages are at sea there's you know we're limited in what we can do to um try and protect them so our main areas are trying to improve make it easier for them to get up and down our rivers but ensure that water quality is as good as possible that they can reach the size they need so that when it does come time to spawning they have the best chance possible to make it to their final destination um like i say we don't tend to catch too many um around watford but um hopefully that will change over the years okay so how do we actually do electrofishing so if you look in the background, you'll see there's a stop net across the river. So we tend to net off, have a net at the bottom and at the top of the stretch, um, <clears throat> often ar around 100 meters or so, give or take, just to give some consistency. And we try to do it at the same spot every year, again, just to improve our consistency. Okay. So, we'll, so we'll have. Um, the sun is clear, right? 
all of our gear on the boat. So, um, and I'll explain that a little bit better, but essentially we work downstream to upstream. Um, the, so the two people on the extremes and then the middle, they're carrying anodes. So they wave those around in the water to attract the fish. And then the netsmen take the fish out, put them in a tub um, in the boat that is full of water that's aerated to allow them to recover. Um, once we complete a run, as we call it, um, we'll then measure the fish, ID them, possibly take scale samples, maybe some photos, keep them in a tank with aeration, and then we'll repeat it maybe another one or two times. Um, the purpose of that being that each time we do it, we want to catch at least 50% or less of what we caught the time before. That shows that we're doing it efficiently. Um, and ultimately that's gonna mean that the data that we get is more robust. <clears throat> But yeah, ultimately what we were trying to do is create an electric field to attract the fish to us, at which point we can remove them and measure them. There's a bit of a crude um, drawing, but kind of explains it. So we've got a power source and then our control box um, that essentially controls how much uh, current we're putting into the water. And that will vary depending on the water quality. So um, if we've got a very high conductivity, you know, the current shooting off everywhere. We're not getting that clean connection um, from positive, from negative to positive. Um, <clears throat> and the same with if we've got very low conductivity, we're still not getting that uh, good draw. So um, yeah, a bit of tinkering there and experience knowing um, what you need to be fishing at. You can see our tub where we store our fish. Um, so the uh, electric charge basically travels from the cathode, so from the negative across the anode. Um, and it's that movement of electrons to the anode that is drawing the fish towards the anode. So, um, yeah, that's sort of the, the key principle, really. Um, obviously, we're mixing electricity and water, so it's, it's risky from our point of view, but also for the fish. So um, if it's done right, um, little to no harm should come to the fish, at least not long term harm. You might have fish that... Um, you know, they might be shocked and might take a while to come around, but generally if you're doing it properly, they do come around. So we undergo a fair bit of training and we have to do a lot of surveys to be signed off to lead, um, lead a survey. Um, but yeah, that's sort of the basic principle. So like I mentioned before, that we're ex exploiting that sensitivity of the lateral line. So we're sending pulses out and, you know, catching the pulses if you like. And that's what's drawing the fish towards us. Um, it's, it's quite exciting when, when you first, this sort of what we call the perception zone. When you first go on, everyone switches on. Um, if you're in an area with a lot of fish, you can just see the fish. They either immediately come towards you or they scatter out. And some fish like pike, they will literally come flying out of the water. I've seen, um, yeah, <laughs> colleagues, uh, male colleagues um, copping, quite large fish where you don't want to be catching them so um but yeah essentially that's we're exploiting the lateral line they come towards us they get immobilized once they get close we scoop them out nine times out of ten they immediately come back round, and we can um, safely put them in the tank to uh, measure them so where do we actually carry out our surveys on the con so we we've got quite a lot of sites on the column but I thought it would it would take quite a while to go over all of them so I thought I would just focus on um, a few of the sites in the Watford area so this purple dot at the top here that's on the Munden estate um, I believe that's our most northern site on the column um, and we come under the motorway to uh, Rat uh, Radlett Recreation Ground um, both of these are sort of long-term monitoring sites. Um, these red sites are new sites that we're going to be investigating as part of the project. So like I said, we'll be doing some um, pre-work surveys to get our baseline and then um, some monitoring in the years to follow to see how things have developed. Um, and then as we come down the catchment, so we've got um, the GUC and the gate joining and the River Chess. And then down at Springwell Lane by Stockers Nature Reserve, um, that's our other site. So it's quite good, really, because we've got a site above Watford, in Watford, and then 
um, further downstream where we've got two other rivers coming in. So expect to see slightly different species there um, as a result. So um, yeah, we'll, so we'll talk a little bit about um, what results we get and how you can interpret them. So the, our wall hall site, um, so the Munden estate. So um, one of the outputs we get from, the, from our surveys is the biomass and we work that out relative to area. So to standardize it, we just do 100 meters squared, so 10 by 10 meters and what is the weight in grams per 100 meters squared. Um, so we've got all our different species. Um, you know, we, we've got some years here, we were catching miracarp, um, others we were catching commons. Um, <clears throat> for the purpose of this site, I'm just going to focus on chub. Um, so that's kind of this um, khaki kind of greenish color. So you can see it fluctuates quite a lot. Um, but in general, you know, a, a pretty decent um, showing. So uh, if you take a rough average, we've got about 1500 grams. So let's call it four pounds of chub for every 10 meters squared. So pretty good, really. Um, I will add as well, unfortunately, because of COVID, we didn't, we weren't able to do any surveys in 2020 or last year. So um, we've got a bit of a gap in the data. It would be really interesting to see what happened because we've had such different river and weather conditions um, since then. Um, so I think the picture is going to be pretty different. But yeah, like I said, we'll focus on the chub. So um, you can see 2017 still going strong, 2018, 2019, massive reduction in biomass. Um, so that makes you think, you know, what, what might have caused that? Another output we get is the density. So how many fish do we have per 100 meters squared? Um, again, if we just focus on the chub, we'll see you know, it's down slightly, but it hasn't actually dropped too much if you compare it to the biomass. So what that's telling us is the number of fish has decreased, is roughly the same, just to simplify things, but the biomass has decreased significantly. So that's telling us that we've got smaller fish rather than bigger fish. Um, well, interestingly, what we also had, um, this beige color is um, density of roach. So you can see that's increased massively. So if you tie that into what we had in terms of weather for those years, so we actually had in Hearts and North London, the area of the environment agency that I sit in, um, we actually declared an environmental drought in 2019. So, um, 2018, even from 2017, really, we were way below average on rainfall. 2018 was exceptionally dry, a dry winter again. Um, and then 2019 was dry yet again. With coarse fish, what you tend to find in um, particularly smaller species like roach, when you've got um, dry weather, you've basically got increased water temperatures um, you've got more sunlight, so both of those are really good for egg, larvae, and fry development. Um, but you also have less washout, so um, those big rain and flood events that tend to wash juveniles out. So we had much less of those, and that's led to an explosion in the roach populations. Um, because the levels are lower, that stretch of river just can't support the same number of big chub that it used to. So um, most likely what's happened is those chub have gone off to deeper areas where they're more happy and feel safer. Maybe the temperature's a bit cooler and the oxygen's a bit more stable. Um, so I think that, yeah, I, I wanted to share that because I think it's a pretty good example of just how um, sort of the weather conditions can um, influence fish populations. And again, just to reinforce that further. So another thing that we can look at is, um, so we call this a length frequency diagram. So on the left, we've got how many fish, and then along the bottom, we've got them in intervals. So um, for example, so this uh, on the far left on the top one, that's, uh, we've got one fish between 60 and 65 millimeters. So if we go back to 2017, when our roach numbers were still low, um, you know, we got a decent spread, but not too many. We come to 2019, 
we've still got a similar spread, but there's a much higher concentration of fish in that smaller range. And, you know, fish around 70, 80 mil, that's, that was probably, I believe we do that survey around sort of, uh, when we do it, I mean, August maybe. So that's potentially that year's or the year before's um, fish. Um, and here's a few fish. Um, that's the, the same perch from earlier, but in a, a different survey year. Um, and a couple of the chub, which um, we commonly associate with the site. Um, and also a nice roach that we caught. You see this one's been in the wars, but um, managed to survive to tell the tale. Um, okay, Radlett Road. Um, so this is one of the sites that we're going to be monitoring. Already you can see, um, get an idea of what happened at this site. So for years, there's really good fish population here, particularly chub and good sized chub too. Um, 2015, um, there was a pretty significant fish kill on the con. I'm sure um, many of the names I saw um, will have been around then um, or aware of that event. Um, and that, yeah, resulted in a lot of, a lot of fish. Promisingly, um, the site is showing good signs of recovery. Um, it's a real shame that we weren't able to survey this the last two years, because I would have really been interested to see how the recovery has progressed, um, especially considering how, the, um, how good the river conditions have been um, and how much rainfall we've had the last couple of years. Um, Again, you can see, um, you know, we've got loads of roach, um, chub, and even dace, you know, one of those species that we associate with good water quality. Um, but yeah, quite sad, really, a, a quite significant drop. Um, but, you know, trending upwards, even with the chub, um, but you can see the roach and the gudgeon, those smaller species that are quite quick to colonize new areas, um, showing really good signs of recovery. So. Um, yeah, given the project um, and the conditions that we've had, I'm, I'm quite optimistic about this and yeah, pretty excited to see how things have changed there. And just some of the fish that we've caught there. So, you know, tiny little chub, that's probably, you know, 50 mil maybe, um, and a small chub, a uh, small roach, sorry, tell red eye, got this nice sort of bluish gray back. Um, and then, so that was 2018, I believe, 2019. So the last time we surveyed it, um, yeah, nice roach recolonizing the area and even picked up a good chub, which must have moved from another location. Um, but for me, the most exciting thing from that survey was this juvenile barbel. Um, it's pretty tricky to catch them in surveys. Um, they're quick, they're small, and they really get, into the vegetation so they can be really hard to um hard to coax out and catch um but that is yeah so promising and the fact that that is um turning up in this location suggests that there's good habitat for juvenile barbel so provided um you know there's adults spawning locally and juveniles can make it there that's a really good sign so anything we can do within the project to um improve the habitat for the these fish is um yeah going to be vital from my perspective and then um, come to the last site I want to look at. So Springwell Lane down at um, Stockers Nature Reserve. Um, I thought I'd just put this in a pie chart just to break up all the graphs. Um, but this is our biomass from our 2019 survey. So we can see it's really dominated by chub um, and good numbers of dace. Again, coming back to the water quality is, is a really good sign. But the reason I wanted to show this site is just the number of species that we, we've caught here. Um, I didn't include them because we didn't have them on the last survey, but we've also had bream. This is one of the sites that we've had eels and also rough, um, which is a really rare catch for us on survey. But this also has all of the minor species I mentioned earlier. So a fantastically diverse site. Um, one of the sites that we really look forward to surveying every year um, just because the diversity of species. Um, so if we compare that to the biomat, to the density, sorry, again, you can see the difference here. So again, so this is bleak, 
um, dominating things in terms of density. And that's, again, tying back into um, how well coarse fish can do um, when we have hot and dry weather. Um, that 2018, 2019, on the surveys that we did, um, the, the numbers of bleak we caught with, across all of Hearts of North London were just incredible. I, I don't know how many thousands of sort of five, six centimetre bleak I measured that those years, but um, yeah, it was incredible. Um, and yeah, again, the days, really good to see that. Um, tying it back into that water quality is always a, a really good sign. But also that, we've also got um, good numbers of predators. Um, so you've got lots of perch um, and pike too. Um, so it's, you know, it's one thing to have a really diverse array of species, but it's important to maintain that predator-prey interaction um, to keep everything in balance. And some of the fish we've caught from this location. Um, yeah, amazing barbel. Um, this one, uh, yeah, sometimes I think we should take scales with on our surveys, but yeah, really impressive fish. Um, the trouble with surveying this location is that there's a weir at the top end and the weir pool itself is too deep um, for us to electrofish safely. So particularly 2018, 2019, um, you know, the rest of the river was low. So that weir was really was, that pool was a refuge. Um, for them so maybe an occasion where a whiz um, you know had a positive impact um, but yeah just meant that those fish were out of reach but I'm, I'm certain they were still in there um, and then this fish on the bottom again a small juvenile that we caught in the 2019 survey so it shows that the habitat's there it shows they are spawning so that's really great to see um, just to come back again I mean what I mentioned about earlier about um, sort of the the zonation of river species um you know this this site just really you know chucks that out the window we've got brown trout barbel and tench and I, I mean we've caught them literally in the same little shoal together um so it just shows how special the colne is really as a river and provided there's the habitat and the water quality um, you know, we can have these species of fish all coexisting with each other. Um, so, yeah, great site. Um, I think that's all I've got, really. Um, yeah, it's, it, I'm, I'm, yeah it's, a, it's annoying that we weren't able to survey the last couple of years. Um, I'm really looking forward to getting back to it. Like I said, the river's been in good nick, um, so it'll be interesting to see um what sort of populations we've got and what these surveys throw up and i'm yeah excited about the project and um yeah hopefully the good results that it's going to produce um so i'll turn my presentation off um oh, thank you martin um that was that was lovely 